I was born in 19, early 1959, and that was about just a year after the Russians launched Sputnik into space. And what was significant about that was my dad was actually a rocket scientist, and I grew up in Southern California in really the hotbed of one of the most explosive sort of entrepreneurial periods in history. And our dining room table was really like a, a graduate course in, in entrepreneurship. And so I was introduced to a world of doing at a very early age. Today I wanted to talk to you about ideas about not doing and really the oscillations between doing and not doing and some of the things I've learned along the way. I uh, was introduced to the idea of kind of a portfolio theory of doing and even today what I do is um, I'm a partner in a venture capital fund that invests in health and sustainability and we nurture and cultivate and grow a portfolio of companies that help to deliver both financial returns and social and environmental benefits in the, uh, in the marketplace. And we have about 18 companies in the portfolio at any one time. So we're very active and busy and doing a lot of things to grow those to scale so that they can have the ultimate impact. Um, from a very early age, I started doing a lot of things. I thought rather than talk about all those, I could I could share with you, I'll go back and let's see if I can find a slide. My wife, when I was um, about turn 50, okay, that slide, what she did was she collected, with the help of my dad, all the business cards of all the companies I'd started since I was 14 <laughs> and put them all up on a nice plaque for me for my 50th birthday. But it um, started to to teach me about this idea of kind of a portfolio of doing lots of things. And also that when you're doing, you're doing things that are happening in a nonlinear way. So a lot of times we think that we build a life of linear activities. We build one thing on top of another thing, but actually the doers in us are always building simultaneously. And I think about it now a little bit like a garden. You could think about cultivating a garden. This is actually what I left in Northern California, just to, to share a little sunshine with you. <laughs> this, is, this is sort of what's happening already. This is, um, this, is a, this is actually a wild but tended garden. And one of the things the garden teaches you very profoundly is the, the cycles of life and rest and doing and not doing. So doing, not doing is actually a form of doing. And it comes from a Taoist notion that was introduced by a, a man like, named Lao Tzu many, many years ago. The term is actually referred to as Wu Wei or Wei Wu Wei, which means doing, non-doing. And this, this oscillation is something that I just wanted to help you sort of integrate today yourselves. This, this sort of up and down, this life and death, this rising and falling. Because really to have a life of doing, you need to not do. So let me take you back a little bit to where this idea kind of came very vividly into my life. And let me introduce you to Team Wu Wei. When my two twin nephews, Jordan and Matthew, turned 13, I felt compelled as their uncle to take them on a, on a walkabout, uh, an opportunity for two young boys to go through the uh, cultural ritual of turning into uh, a man. This is Jordan and Matt here, and this is actually my son, Sam, who's about a year younger. And we set off on a bike trip in the San Juan Islands off the coast of um, Washington State near Seattle, Washington. It was a beautiful trip. And the, the idea was really for the boys to generate a, a sense of confidence and to learn their way and learn to take care of themselves, to learn to set up a tent and a campsite and 
um, all during the course of the week together, riding and kayaking and walking and hiking and just being together, we developed this sense of doing and not doing. And um, I found myself sort of writing little lessons for them. Uh, and I also wanted to make sure you know who the fathers of Team Wu Wei. This is my brother-in-law, Mike, who's here with us today. But um, this is sort of the gene pool you'll see that enters into this. But Jordan and Matt, in uh, particular, were so ready to embrace these lessons. And the lessons of Team Wu Wei were sort of uh, things like, on the, si on the other side of every hill is another hill. Uh, economy of motion, uh, finish strong. I'm trying to remember the, all the things, but I wrote them down in this um, little book. You know, it was interesting th to hear all the uh, conversation here about this kind of um, physicality of ideas. And I wrote all the ideas down in this little notebook. And even the, the, the three boys generated such an identity during the week that they started being called Team Wu Wei. And, um, you know, they, de they developed a lot of um, attitude, a uh, sense of the positive attitude. They, they developed, uh, you know, an aptitude for sort of being in the world and being on their own. But at that time, what I really didn't understand was the importance to developing a sense of amplitude, you know, a sense of pacing. I had always thought that everything was sort of full on, full throttle all the way. Now looking back past age 50, I realize that in order to sustain a life of doing, you really have to practice not doing. So one way of thinking about this is um, sort of stages of life. We, we arrive in life as children w with a sense of innocence and a feeling of uh, magic. There's magic in our life. Everything's possible. I can feel at the do lectures the sense of magic for many people. As we emerge in the room, we, in the world, we try to find a sense of mastery. This is where we construct the confidence and the ego and the and and the the, the feel for doing well in the world and making a difference. Then as we emerge through that period of our lives, then we start to search really for meaning and, and depth and understanding and deeper connections. And then maybe as we emerge and pass through life, we uh, you know, emerge in a, in a place of real mystery. So I've been thinking about this as sort of an arc of mastery and um, that this ascendant view that we have as sort of entrepreneur, entrepreneurs who succeed and fail and succeed and fail and that we keep ascending, we don't really integrate this till we reach those very low points on that arc of the, of the amplitude and then reemerge. So Wu Wei is this notion of doing, not doing, and there's really sort of four levels to it that I want to explain to you. Um, it draws from a little book called The Tao Te Ching. How many people have heard of this book? It's, it's one of the most frequently published books next to the Bible, actually. It was transcribed by a man named Lao Tzu about 2,500 years ago. I wanted to just read a little bit from, from it for you because it's really a conundrum very paradoxical. It's really interesting and difficult to, um, to understand. But let me just introduce a little bit. So the Tao, the Tao really means the, the, the way. The Tao Te Ching is the book of the way or the, the way of nature. So it's really about being in the world in a way that one is with nature. And as a gardener, you can appreciate why this um, speaks to me so, so vividly. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can't be named is not the eternal name. The unnameable is the eternally real. Naming is the origin of all particular things. Free from desire, you realize the mystery. Caught in desire, you see only the manifestations. Yet mystery and manifestations rise from the same source. 
This source is called darkness. Darkness within darkness, the gateway to all understanding. And there's 81 chapters, short chapters, and then there's this profound statement that says, practice not doing and everything will fall into place. Practice not doing and everything will fall into place. Practice not doing and everything will fall into place. What does that mean? So there's four types of not doing from, from my assessment. The first, first type of not doing is sort of being engaged, being present, paying attention, but consciously not acting. How often do we need to do that in our work? We have an impulse to act. We have an impulse to do, but the right thing to do is not to do. That's really the first level. So it might manifest itself really best expressed as maybe patience. This is the Chinese symbol for patience. The next level of not doing or non-doing is what you might think of as stillness. This is a place of actually, again, still staying engaged, but being quiet enough so that the truth might present itself to you. So you are sitting, waiting, being, breathing, getting out of the way, and not doing. A lot of people this morning told me they were ready for some stillness, that their minds were saturated with ideas. And so this is the place where we seek that peaceful place to realize what to do next. The third, the third level of non-doing is um, one that I, for lack of a better word, I would think of as sort of flow or effortlessness. Um, this is the place where great dancers and, and actors and, and athletes, I'm going to see John help me with a little bit of a video here. I thought I'd just show you this. This is Joe Montana one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time from the San Francisco 49ers. Ed's standing up to watch this. I can see this. But if you can just watch for a moment, Joe Montana was just famous for being able to, under pressure, move and escape the 300-pound guys that were rushing at him. And, you know, just in a moment of um, pure sort of unexpected pressure, he would convert these am amazing plays. And that was Joe Montana. He was sort of the ultimate in doing, not doing, under pressure. So this, this third level is this place where you are so masterful at your doing that you get out of your way to achieve this flow. So the fourth stage is, um, and, and that, that level that Joe Montana's on, that's kind of, I wouldn't call that really a spiritual level. You know, he, he really cares about getting that touchdown. <laughs> you know, he knows what he's doing and he knows what his goal is and he's purely focused on it, but he gives way to his inner talent and his inner force at that moment. So this, this fourth this fourth level is, is the one that's most elusive and is the one that I would say at this stage in my life I am still learning how to do and not do. And th this, is, this is the level of doing without attachment. Doing, being fully committed to something that you care deeply and passionately about without being attached to the outcome of that doing. This is the most perplexing part of the, uh, the Taoist practice. There's, a, there's another wonderful line in here. Less and less do you need to force things until finally you arrive at non-action. So this is this place of liberation, 
really freedom for your desire to do and change and act, but to do it in a way that you are completely unattached to the outcome. So a couple ways I sort of practice not doing to share with you. So first is unplug. It's a little easier coming to a place with no internet access. But you know, as Sasha mentioned, it's, it's very difficult. We're, we're addicted now to these devices. And we're entrained, I notice. We're just entrained to respond and react and look and feel. So really, the first step, I think, is to actually have the definitive practice of unplugging. That's simple. Sitting. We've had some really good teachers here teaching us to sit. But it's more than meditating. It's sitting and being quiet and being in that second place. It's patience. And then it's sitting and stillness to invite the truth. Gardening has been, I think, what's been most profound and catalytic for me. And gardening is really uh, a synonym for care. I think if you bring into your life a, an outlook or an attitude of care, of generosity, of gardening, gardening is something that you also have to do with the seasons. And you begin to respect the cycles of life and death and dormancy and budding and harvest. <coughs> and I find that in doing and not doing and sustaining a life of doing, that this respect and appreciation for these cycles uh, is very integral. Also, I think listening has become a, a, a core tenant of not doing. Uh, the generosity of giving someone else your attention and listening to them and listening deeply and listening for the cues of stories that are not easily told somehow can release a place of not doing. It's interesting because one of the, the things I really appreciate about this gathering is there's a lot of listening and it's not just one to many, but I notice in the conversations there's a lot of listening. But we live in a culture more and more, this storytelling driven culture where everybody wants to tell and not as many people really are prepared to listen. So in this non-doing, cultivating really the skill of deep listening, I think is part of, uh, part of this practice. And then finally, in the spirit of what you've heard already this morning, is this this ability to give. And you have to do it in a way that's both generous, but is also with great humility. And it's funny, um, I'm always happiest, I think, when I'm not asking for anything from anyone, which is difficult when you're raising money. But it does free up something uh, in you that's able to give. So 12 years ago, when I um, wrote that little book of the, um, the Team Wu Wei Handbook, I then turned it into a little <coughs> published book. And I, of course, gave it to my nephews and gave it to some friends. And then it also had a little bit of a viral kind of life to it. And people kept asking me for the Team Wu Wei Handbook. So I, would self-publish them at a, at a copy store. And then for my brother-in-law, Mike's 50th birthday, I actually used the tools of uh, the iPhoto store to put it into a little more professional version. So it lives on. Um, and I, I wanted to share this because, David, you had shared your Path of the Doer book. And I just find that. Um, taking these ephemeral concepts and going off into the mountains and transcribing them for others to discover along the way is um, quite a valuable gift. So thank you very much.